Are you struggling to manage flare-ups of your pain? You may even be finding that they're worsening in severity and duration. This is something I hear every day in my pain management clinic, so in this video I'm going to share the 10 ways that you can manage your flare-ups better in the same way that many of my patients have. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Mahin and I'm a physiotherapist specialising in pain management based in the UK. On this channel we explore lifestyle strategies and tools that help manage pain and create healthier and happier lives. Today I'll be talking about what causes a flare-up, our usual responses to this increase in pain, and finally I'll be sharing 10 ways that you can manage your flare-ups better. So let's get into it. Let's first start by discussing what a flare-up is, and I'm gonna do this by explaining some definitions of acute pain, chronic pain, and flare-up. So if we take a look at the definitions on the board, we can see that acute pain is pain that typically lasts for less than three months. Now, this is when pain is protective and it's helpful. We need pain to keep us alive and stop us from doing silly things because it warns us that, you know, there's a danger there or something's wrong. So. In this acute phase, the pain is protective and it's helpful. And usually within this acute phase, it is related to tissue changes. So that might be injury um, or damage. So if you, let's say, break your arm, uh, you will have pain and you'll be in a cast for about kind of six to eight weeks. And after that time, the body will heal itself, the pain goes away, and that acute pain period has then finished. Now, sometimes, pain lasts for longer than three months, and this is what we call chronic pain. And this is when our pain system has become overprotective and oversensitized. And the pain is not as helpful as it was now in the acute phase because there is actually little damage or little injury left after a three month mark, because that's usually how long it takes for the body to heal. But the pain is still present, so that's why it becomes less helpful than it was before. And the key thing here is that in chronic pain, the tissue changes are no longer the predominant cause of the pain. We know that pain is our protective system and it responds to a variety of factors. And in this case, then the tissue changes are not the leading cause of that pain. So if we go over to flare up then, we can see that flare ups are the periodic major increases in the pain that we normally experience and the associated symptoms that come along with that. And those associated symptoms might be pins and needles, numbness, fatigue, headaches. And some people also report kind of limb heaviness and just a real kind of overwhelming sense of kind of weakness as well. And it's really key to note that this is different to the day-to-day -day variations in your pain that you might have normally. And here we can see that it's a periodic major increase in the pain normally experienced. So if you are getting something that's new for you, it is also important to get that checked out by a doctor or a health professional um, if you are concerned that it might not be related to your usual pain flares as well. So please consult someone if you do feel this is different to a normal flare-up symptom. And flare-ups can be unpredictable in nature sometimes. They can range from anything from a day to even a couple of weeks at times. And flare-ups vary from person to person, but also each flare-up that you have might be different to the one before. The most important thing to remember is that flare-ups are not an indication of damage and they are a temporary increase in the sensitivity of your pain system. And anything that makes us unhappy can also make our pain and nervous system unhappy as well. And flare-ups can happen for a whole host of reasons and these include overdoing a certain activity which can lead to us going through the boom and bust cycle. I've done a previous video on the boom bust cycle and I'll leave a link to that in the description below. But basically what the boom bust cycle is, is when we have a big increase in our activity levels, perhaps let's say on a good day, which is then met by a decrease in our activity levels because we have a flare-up in our pain, which means that we can't do as much. And over time, when we're going through these increases and decreases in activity, we actually get a reduction in function over time just because it's not a sustainable way of managing activity. So that can be one of the reasons for a flare-up is when we overdo things. On the flip side to that, we can also get flare-ups if we go through a period of excessive rest. And this might be forced upon us, let's say through illness and we are forced to rest. Um, some people actually say that even kind of over festive periods like Christmas when you're resting a little bit more, we can actually get increases in pain because of that. So overdoing things is not great, but also resting too much is not good because we know that for management of pain, activity levels are really important. And because pain's our protective system, other things that can lead to flare-ups are things like increased stress and also poor sleep as well. And significant life events or life changes such as job loss, bereavement, 
divorce, and even moving house can actually be a real source of stress and can lead to flare-ups as well. Now remember, anything that makes us unhappy makes our pain system unhappy and can lead to a flare-up. And as I mentioned before, also things like illness. So if you've got something else going on, pain protects against that thing and it can lead to a flare-up as well. But also if there's any kind of changes in other health problems that you might have. So for example, if you've got diabetes and that's been poorly controlled, then that might mean that you experience more pain. Now the reason that I'm telling you about this is not to kind of overwhelm you with all these different things that might be causing a flare-up, but it's really important to sometimes think about what might be causing flare-ups regularly for you and to see if there's any pattern. So it might be activity related, but it could even just be when you're going through a patch of bad sleep or you know something really stressful has happened and your flare-ups are actually more related to stress than they are with activity. So it will be different for everyone. And sometimes as well, it's not easy to put your finger on it. So flare-ups can happen without any known cause or any identifiable kind of trigger. They just seem to just happen without reason. So it's not always possible to know what's causing a flare-up. So for the next part of the video, I just want us to think about ways in which you might have changed your behaviours in response to pain. And I'm going to use examples of what my patients have typically told me in the past in terms of their responses to pain. And we're going to talk about the short-term effects of that, but then also the long-term effects of that as well. So one of the most common responses to an increase in pain is reducing or avoiding certain activities that are painful. And this could be things like bending and lifting if, if they have back pain, for example, or it might even be that they reduce something like their walking. And this is very understandable because obviously these painful activities are not a nice thing to be pushing into. And a normal response to pain is to actually avoid those things that are painful. Now in the short term, that can actually lead to a reduction in pain because you're not doing the things that are aggravating the pain. But in the long term, what it actually leads to is a reduction in function related to that activity, a a reduction in strength and a reduction in physical capacity as well. So it actually means that when we return to that activity, even if it was at the previous level to what you were doing before, it becomes more painful to do the activity. So as a general rule, the more that we avoid a certain activity, the more painful it becomes when we have to go back to that activity. Now, I've done another video on the pain cycle before that I'll leave a link to in the description as well. And that talks about how when we have pain, understandably, we have a fear or a concern or a worry that that pain is going to get worse. So we're going to do something to trigger off that pain. That leads to us avoiding activities over time that are painful, which then leads to a reduction in function and strength related to that activity. And also, when we're not able to do the things that we enjoy, that leads to a lowering of mood, and that cycle just continues going round with more pain, more kind of fear and worry, and more avoidance. Check out that video if you haven't already at the end of this one. The next one that people usually report is during a flare-up, they tend to withdraw from people or certain situations. And in the short term, this leads to less anxiety as they're not having to see people or they're not having to leave the house. But in the long term, the longer that goes on for, the more anxiety there is when they want to go and see people again or want to leave the house. And it can lead to a lot of kind of social anxiety if we've isolated ourselves away from people. So we get the increased isolation and the kind of low mood comes with that as well but also then the increased anxiety when we want to then return to normal things and normal socialization. The third most common thing that people mention is spending more time in bed to get away from the pain. Again, similar to the first example, this might lead to less pain in the short term because we're not moving as much, so we're not causing as much pain. But in the long term then, it leads to a reduction in function, a reduction in fitness and physical capacity, poorer sleep because we're spending more time in bed, so our body's not able to get into the kind of its 24 hour clock, which we know is so important for sleep. And then that also leads to low mood as well. So again, similar to that pain cycle that I spoke about. The fourth one is that people find that they usually try to change their positions in either sitting or lying because they're not able to tolerate one position for as long during a flare-up. Now this can be a good thing in the short term because it can help reduce stiffness and also reduce pain in the short term. And this can also actually be helpful in the long term as well because it means we're spending less time sedentary, which means that we're able to go back to our normal activities a lot quicker. So I spoke about the pain cycle, which is that pattern of avoidance that leads to a reduction in physical capacity and mood over time. But we also have the boom-bust cycle, which I spoke about at the beginning of this video. And another common response to a flare-up is actually just continuing to push through that pain. And we do this because, you know, we don't want that pain to control us. So we want to have that sense of control. And one way of doing that is just by ignoring the pain and pushing through it, or, you know, at least trying to ignore it. It's a very 
difficult thing to ignore. But we know, again, so the harder that we push into pain, the harder pain pushes back, and we go through this boom-bust cycle again, and that leads to a reduction in function over time. The other thing with the boom-bust cycle is that it actually leads to the flare-ups lasting longer over time because the time spent sedentary or not as active starts to increase. And that just leads to poorer control pain over the next kind of weeks and months as well. Another common response is spending more time and energy in trying to control the pain. And this can be done through various means such as kind of heat packs, cold packs, tens, massage, that kind of thing. And all of these things are seen as passive interventions, so they can give a really good short-term relief, but actually the effects are only short-lived and they don't last too long. Now again, these can be a really useful tool to have during flare-ups because sometimes we need that short-term relief. And it can also be a really useful tool to have in the future as well. So even in the long term, there's nothing wrong with using these strategies if they do give you a relief. It's just knowing what exactly they're doing. So we know that the actual physiological effects of things like heat, cold, massage, and TENS are really short-lived. And a lot of the time people can get into a bit of a sticky situation because they become over-reliant on those things and it becomes their only strategy of managing pain. Now, in isolation, they're probably not that helpful, but if you're using it as part of your wider pain management or flare-up management plan, actually, they can be quite helpful. It's just really important to make sure that we're not spending all of our energy and time using those things, because if we're using all of our energy with the passive interventions, then we don't have as much energy to spend on our meaningful activities. And we know that the most important thing at managing pain in the long term is engaging with your meaningful and enjoyable activities. Now, this next one's quite a common one, as well and it's eating more comfort foods and what I mean by comfort foods is those foods that we turn to when we're particularly stressed or you know we're tired or we're having an increase in pain and those comfort foods will be different for everyone as well but in the short term that can actually lead to an improvement in mood so you know we're, we're feeling good when we're eating the things that we want to eat but in the long term it leads to increasing levels of pain because of that low-grade neuroinflammation that happens when we're eating things like processed foods or junk food as well the other thing when we're not eating too well is it can have a real hit on our energy levels and we can experience more fatigue when we're not eating as well. And, and that just then kind of makes that flare up last a little bit longer than perhaps it would otherwise. And we know that there's a link between what we eat and how we sleep at night. So eating kind of very heavy foods late at night can really impact our sleep. And we know as well that food and our diet has a really close link with our mental health as well. And eating more processed foods actually leads to more kind of anxiety and depression. So it's just a really key one to think about as well because it can be a really good kind of coping tool however only in the short term um, because yeah it just leads to all those other effects in the long term so it's good to have an awareness of that. Now finally the last one is trying other means to reduce the pain and this can be done through medication which is a typical one it can even be done through alcohol sometimes or it can even be done through kind of street drugs or drugs that aren't usually prescribed for pain in this country and this can be through medication which is obviously a typical one but it can also be done through alcohol as well and also street drugs so so again we can have that short-term relief from pain we can also have more increased relaxation but also it can kind of numb the feelings that we're having so if we're going through a particularly stressful time which is then causing a flare-up you know things like alcohol and drugs can actually numb that feeling and make us feel good in that short term now it doesn't take too long for us to see the kind of adverse effects of that and it might even be kind of the next day when we're thinking about alcohol with that hangover feeling but in the long term we know that it can actually increase the sensitivity of our nervous system when we're overusing any of these types so whether that is medication or alcohol it can actually increase the sensitivity of our nervous system over time smoking is a similar one so again smoking in the short term can feel quite good and it can be a coping strategy to manage pain but actually then in the long term, smoking actually increases our nerve sensitivity by up to three times. So it can actually increase pain levels. So apart from poorer control pain, using these strategies in the long term can lead to dependence as well. So if we're overusing things like medication and alcohol, it, we can actually form a dependence on that in the long term. We also can develop a tolerance to medication. So as a general rule, the longer that we take medication for, the less effective it becomes over time because our body develops a tolerance to it. And the same can go with alcohol and it can just actually mean that we need 
increasing levels of medication and alcohol to get that same relief or that same short-term kind of numbing feeling that we initially got. As a prescriber, I see people on you know the high ends of, of medication and, and those that unfortunately have turned to alcohol to manage their pain. And it's a really difficult situation to come back from. So once your body develops that tolerance, even though it's not managing the pain anymore, when you try to take away the medication, for example, actually it can lead to lots of withdrawal symptoms. So we're very quickly on a high level of medication that isn't doing much for pain, but you're getting lots of side effects. And then when trying to come off it, you can get some withdrawal effects as well. So it's really key to note and be aware of how you're using things like medication and alcohol during a flare up. And of course, with all of these substances, we can feel more sedated, which just reduces our activity levels in general. And it can also really impair our cognitive functions. So things like memory and concentration. We know that people with pain anyway can struggle with that sometimes, is, is kind of the, the concentration levels the next day, the memory levels, they're kind of finding the right word for things. So when we're using medication and alcohol alongside that already, you know, that's just really not helpful at all in the long term. So friends, it's really important to notice the longer term impact of these responses rather than just the immediate short term effects. The responses I've just talked about are fine for, you know, a day or so, um, when I'm thinking more of kind of the activity ones that we spoke about before. They're okay for a day or so, but then it's really important that we actually have an awareness of the long-term impact of doing these things if we carried on. So, you know, use this video as a resource, you know, watch it during a flare up. And the really important thing is to gradually get back to your normal activities. So let's now think about some more helpful management strategies for your flare ups. So as I mentioned before, the first step in managing a flare up is to acknowledge that it's happening. It can be really tempting to try and ignore it because you know flare ups are inconvenient a lot of the time, but also quite distressing. But unfortunately, trying to ignore the flare up and trying to push through is just gonna make that flare up last longer and probably increase the severity of it as well. So here are now 10 useful ways to manage your flare ups. The first one is noticing. So as I mentioned, the most important thing when you're having a flare up is acknowledging when it's happening. The other thing is also noticing anything that might predetermine a flare up. So, you know, if there's any patterns that you're seeing with your flare ups, if it's after doing a particular activity, if it's related to stress, if it's related to poor sleep. So noticing what tends to cause your flare ups and then noticing when your flare ups beginning so that you can quickly access and implement your flare up management plan. It's also really important to notice the normal responses that I spoke about earlier because we know that those responses now are not helpful in the long term. So noticing when you're starting to do them is really important. The second good way to manage a flare up is actually by temporarily decreasing your activity level slightly before gradually reintroducing them again. And these activities can be things like walking, shopping, working, exercising, or engaging with your normal enjoyable activities. And you can use goal setting here to give yourself a clear roadmap on your way out of the flare up. So what I mean by that is, if you've reduced your walking, let's say, if you set some goals for yourself that, okay, I want to walk five minutes tomorrow. Let's say you normally walk, you know, 20 minutes a day and you say, okay, I wanna walk five minutes tomorrow and the day after. The day after that, I wanna walk seven and eight minutes. The day after that, I wanna walk 10 minutes. And you can just slowly you know, map out what your progress is gonna look like because you can then see yourself coming out of the flare up, but also you can make sure that you're gradually returning to things because that's gonna be really helpful in the long term. If you find that you're having to withdraw from people because it can be quite a drain on energy, you know, communicating with others, which is understandable, then maybe trying different forms of communication during your flare up. So if you know that speaking to friends and family is important to you, but you're not able to do it in the same way during a flare up, maybe switching to things like uh, text messaging or, you know, WhatsApping or even just short phone calls. You may even want to do video calling as well as your flare up starts to improve. But then the really important thing is then gradually again, returning to your normal social activities. The other thing is if you want to see someone face to face, sometimes it's a little bit easier to maybe invite them to your house. So you're not having to go through the effort of kind of getting ready, traveling there, you know, potentially sitting on something uncomfortable. At least you know within your own house that you've kind of got more control over that environment and that can sometimes be a little bit easier. And then again, once you're feeling better, then actually then going back to normal activities and seeing people outside of the house. So the next one is to avoid lying in bed or resting for long periods of time. Now again, this might be absolutely necessary for the first day or two, 
but it's really important then to start to gradually increase those activity levels again so that we're not increasing the length of that flare up. It's also really important to return to your normal kind of bedtime routine. So when we're spending more time in bed during the day, that can really kind of mess up bedtime routines and our 24 hour clock because our body doesn't know when it's time to prepare for bed because we're spending most of our time in bed. So it's really important that we go back to normal routines to help with sleep as well. The fifth one is one of the most important ones and it's probably the, one of the most important pain management strategies in general, but especially during flare ups and that's pacing, planning and prioritizing. And this is to kind of combat the boom bust cycle. I've done a previous video on the boom bus cycle and pacing, planning and prioritizing. And as I mentioned before, I'm gonna leave the link to that in the description below. The next one's kind of bringing an awareness to your eating habits and your patterns. So you might wanna do this by actually writing down what you're eating during a flare up to see what your kind of patterns are. And then when you're out of a flare up, what you actually might find helpful is doing something like batch cooking. So during a flare up, obviously we're gonna to wanna to turn to the most convenient foods because cooking is gonna be a bit of an issue. But if we're actually then, you know, planning for that ahead by batch cooking, then you know that you've got healthy stuff in the freezer that you can just defrost and eat rather than having to cook yourself or having to turn to kind of things that are less healthy for you. It's really important even during flare ups to make sure that you're eating regularly as we need that energy for your body processes to happen as normal and just to make you feel good, have more energy and have less pain. As well as batch cooking, another way to make sure that we're still eating healthy is just by creating the optimal environment for yourself. So by not buying snacky foods or processed foods or foods that aren't good for you, and actually buying more healthy snacks instead means that when you are having a flare up, the things that you turn to are the things that within your cupboards and your fridges that are healthier options. So it's just about kind of setting yourself up in the best way possible for when you are having the flare up. Because during a flare up, you wanna create as much friction as possible between you and your desired behaviors. So by actually creating that optimal environment beforehand is a really good way of doing that. I spoke a little bit about kind of jotting things down with relation to diet, but also it can be really helpful to just do some journaling whilst you are having a flare up anyway. Tapping into things like mindfulness practices, relaxation, breathing work can be really good during a flare up because it's a really good way of just kind of calming down our pain system and just bringing us back to the present moment. During flare ups, you know, our mind can be out of control in terms of the worries about the future, you know, how long is the flare up gonna last? When can I return to work? All of those things. So it's really important just to bring yourself back to the present moment and some mindfulness exercises are a really good way to do that uh, along with breathing as well. Writing down your thoughts can be really useful because you can also see the kind of thought patterns that you get into during flare-ups. So number eight is having a flare-up plan. Now you can do that through physical aids. So you can do that through kind of heat, cold, tens, you know, knowing what's working for you to give you that short-term relief is really important, but also communicating with those around you. So if you're living with your family, actually communicating your needs to your family about the things you need during a flare-up. And this can just make things a lot easier because sometimes there can be a bit of a distinction between what you need and what your family potentially understands about what you need. So being really clear with your communication about your needs is really important. And having this flare up plan in place before you actually need it is really important because then when you are having your flare up, you've got that plan to turn to, making it easier for you. We spoke about medication before and it might be that during a flare up, you temporarily increase your medication slightly but then it's really important to then start to reduce again as you come out of that flare up because we don't want that body to develop the tolerance to it because the next time that you need it then, you're having to you know, increase your medication levels even more. It's always really important that you speak to your doctor or your pain specialist around medication because they can advise on which medication potentially might be the best and you can also let them know about what's potentially worked for you in the past and what hasn't. And by using medications for flare-ups only, what we're actually allowing is for our body not to develop a tolerance to it. So when we're taking medication regularly, okay, at this level, our body will develop a certain tolerance to that. So then what we have to do during a flare-up is add another layer on top of that of medication. Now, if we don't reduce back down to that normal level, then that becomes the new norm. And then for the next flare-up, we have to add another layer on top of that. Now, if we're only using medication for flare-ups and this is the normal level, you might not be on, be on any medication, but if you are, let's say you're on a low level of medication and it's here, then you temporarily increase your level of medication before coming back down to your normal level. 
And what that means is that when we're only using medication in that temporary way, rather than that routine way, is that it has more of an effect on your pain when you need it. This is dependent on the type of medication, of course. So as I mentioned, please consult your doctor or your pain specialist about medication if you've got any questions about that. So managing your flare-ups is important so that you can return to your important and meaningful activities a lot quicker, as we know that it's these important and meaningful activities that are the best solution in the long term for managing pain. So try and engage with these activities and your values in a different way, even during pain flare-ups. An example of this might be, let's say that you enjoy dancing and you that's something you usually do when you're not in a pain flare-up. You might not be able to do the actual activity of dancing during a flare-up, but even something like listening to music can keep you connected with that value. Another example is if your friends and family are a real value to you, then you know, maintaining some sort of connection even during flare-ups, whether that is phone calls or text messages, it might not be in the same way that you normally do, but it's really important to keep in touch with your values and important activities, as these will help manage your pain as well, even during flare-ups. To learn more about how you can return to your meaningful activities so that you're living a full life, head over to my pain management playlist. These videos go further into the best management strategies for persistent pain, so be sure to check that out. Thanks for watching, take care, and I'll see you next week.